25 years of marriage and you have nothing to say? I'll just say it. I slept with someone. If you, you keep cow, talking, but, I'm gonna get out of the car. I think the fact that I did it, it just shows how broken we are. Okay. And how much, how much we really... Oh my God! Cow! You're getting a divorce? Yeah. Amy heard you crying in the bathroom. We all thought it was cancer. Oh. Thank God, man. Yeah, <laughs> just my relationship. <laughs> Hi, can I buy you a drink? Uh-huh. Let's get out of here. Want to get out of here? Yeah. What are you doing later? <laughs> I don't know. I do. There's lots of beautiful women in this bar, but I can't take my eyes off of you. It's time to go home. Oh, it's forward of you, but okay. Yeah. Should uh, I pull the car around? Have you been drinking? I'll drive. Hey, ladies man guy. You any tips of the trade? Your wife cheated on you because you lost sight of who you are as a man. Why don't you take that straw out of your mouth? It looks like you're sucking on it. <coughs> okay. You're sitting there with a super cut haircut, and you're wearing a 44, and you should be wearing a 42 regular. Credit card. Where are your wallets? Did you sleep in them? Jeez, God! Yeah, probably. You would? You gotta take control of your manhood, pal. Can you put on some clothes, please? Oh, I'm sorry, is this bothering you? Beautiful. I want to show you off to my ex-wife make her really jealous. <laughs> oh, man. I met a girl, and she is a game changer. She's your soulmate, right? Go get her back. Wow, how old are you? <laughs> I'm in love with her, and I don't know what to do about it. I don't know when you and I stop being us. You know, when I told you that I had to work late, I really went to see the new Twilight movie by myself. And it was so bad. I just wanted to. I should have fought for you. <laughs> take off your shirt. Why? Will you take off your shirt? Seriously? It's like you're photoshopped. You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, From the AfterBuzz studios in Los Angeles, California, and streaming live on Ustream, this is AfterBuzz TV for Crazy Stupid Love. We'll break down the film and get you all the latest news and gossip about Crazy Stupid Love. If you'd like to buzz into tonight's show, you can buzz us at 424-256-1729. That's 424-256-1729. And now, picking up where the show leaves off, and the buzz continues. Hello, hello, hello. What's up, everybody? Ben Lyons here at the house that Menounos built, After Buzz TV headquarters, joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Scott Mance, Scott everybody. Scott Movie Mance, ladies and gentlemen, here with Ben Lyons from E, Scott Mance from Access Hollywood. No longer After Buzz TV today. It's After Buzz After Movies. Buzz at the movies. I love it, Scott. You and I have known each other for a long time now. We see each other on the circuit covering films around the world. You for Access Hollywood, me for the E Channel. Now here we are, united, to talk about a, a fantastic romantic comedy. Finally, a match made in heaven, and talk about a movie made in heaven. How much did you love this film? Well, I, we get into I, I've it. seen it twice now, and I'm a huge Steve Carell fan, so I had high expectations going into this. He's made some great films over the years. Dan in Real Life, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, of course. We all know what he does every day on The Office. But I, I've always had a theory about romantic comedies and that the best ones seem to be told either from the guy's perspective or at least include the guy in part of the action. The guy's not just an ancillary one-note character. And here, Steve Carell playing a guy who's down on his luck. The movie opens with him getting separated from his wife, Julianne Moore. It just takes you on a romantic ride that's very funny and has lots of twists and turns. I found myself enjoying every moment of this film. I couldn't agree more. And the thing is, before I saw Crazy Stupid Love, I saw Friends with Benefits with Justin Timberlake and mm -hmm. Mila Kunis. That opened the week before. And up to that point, I thought that that was the best romantic comedy of the year. 
thought that was a wonderful film. Justin Timberlake and Mila had great chemistry. And then I saw this film. This film, it's smarter. It's more vast. It's an ensemble. The cast is superb. And there is a great surprise in this film that we just cannot we can't, spoil. Definitely not going to give that away. And this is a film that going into it, while I did have high expectations, I was a little skeptical because this kind of film can be drowned by its premise where Ryan Gosling plays a ladies' man who helps Steve Carell get his mojo back to win back his wife, Julianne Moore. And then you sprinkle in Emma Stone in the mix because she's hot right now, and you throw in Kevin Bacon and Marissa Tomei because there's some familiar faces there. And this could have been in the vein of Valentine's Day or How Do You Know or He's Just Not That Into You where you have a bunch of celebrities coming together and they're just that on screen, celebrities as opposed to real characters. And this didn't have that, thankfully. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the premise. You have Steve Carell and Julian Moore. They've been married for 25 years. They're they're definitely past the itch. They're, they're bored with each other. He wears sneakers to work. Wear you know, sneakers on his date night in a fancy restaurant. Exactly. Clearly, so on the way home, yeah. on the way home, she says, "I slept with somebody else," and he's totally numb to it. He just jumps out of the car. The car is still moving. That's how numb he is to this. But and it crushes him. It destroys him. You know, he clearly cares for her, but he's he's managed to lose sight of of making her happy and of how to kind tell of her. Phoned in his marriage. Her. You're a married guy. You know how it is. You got to. It's marriage. Every, is work. Right. Marriage is a beautiful thing, but you constantly have to stay on your toes. Marriage. You have to make it work. You have to keep the romance going. And after 25 years, maybe who can blame them for blame him for losing touch with how to keep that going? And so. So they're separating. He's back at work. He's numb. Everybody thinks he has cancer, and they're just glad that he doesn't. So he goes to a bar to drown his sorrows, and he's talking up his sob story to somebody. And across the room, ladies' man of the year, the absolute pickup artist, Ryan Gosling, hears his story, and he he has been a love conqueror. He, he has had all these conquests, and he looks across that room, and he sees Steve Carell and says, this guy is going to be my next conquest. And and Gosling has that quality when he walks on screen. You forget all the other great roles he's played over the years, and you forget that he's primarily a dramatic actor by trade. And he embodies this smooth-talking, fast-talking ladies' man. Women love this guy in real life. I don't know a girl in my life who's not obsessed with Ryan Gosling. Well, and why wouldn't they? They saw The Notebook in 2004, which one of the best – Romances. Why do you think Maria came to hang out today? She just wanted to hear us talk about Ryan Gosling. She has no interest in watching us. Do Ryan this. Gosling Duh. has been. <laughs> 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 but Ryan Gosling, you know, here's the thing about about Ryan Gosling. He's a very intense actor. Even though, even though The Notebook was a commercial film, it was a serious movie. Sure. It's not a comedy by any means. Sure. But Ryan Gosling's movies have typically been very intense films, like last year, Blue Valentine, a very raw, intense, and very depressing film. A very depressing take on love, and this is a far more optimistic one. Steve Carell's son, who's about 13 or 14 in this, is coming into his own uh, uh, as a young man and finding He's got love. got a crush on the babysitter. For the first time, a crush on the babysitter. We've all been there. Yes, we have. And, and, and uh-huh. Gosling, you know, has his has his Lothario ways, but he can even tell that he's been a, 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 is a little bored with but this, who, this stage in his life. But who knew Ryan Gosling could play comedy? That, to me, was the revelation of this movie. He is Freaking funny. Very funny, very intense. Some one-liners that guys are going to be saying to each other, I think, for a long time. Especially I, especially after every time they go up to a girl at a bar, they're going to say, let's get out of here. Well, also, I, I just think you're going to hear guys saying all the time, be better than the gap. Be better than the gap. Be better exactly. than the gap. There's good, there's good lines a in lot, this movie. You know, what's, you know what, what could have really had this movie kind of take astray was the, there were a lot of montage sequences in this, or as I like to call, the time in movie when movies when stuff gets done. You have right. to accelerate the plot. You have to make some time elapse. And here they're done with a very caring hand, and they're enjoyable, and they're set to fun uh, to a fun soundtrack. And the time in this movie when Steve Carell changes his entire wardrobe, for example, is funny, and it moves, and it makes sense. It's not an afterthought. It's not dismissed to say, okay, hurry up, let's get to the transformation now when he's come out of this whole, whole makeover. That's a great sequence in the film. But you know what's an even better sequence is after, after Gosling shows uh, Steve Carell how to you know, step up his game, then 
Steve Carell becomes the ladies' man. That scene in the bar. Great scene at the bar. It looks like it's all one take. It looks like it's all one take. But every time he goes up to a woman, the the, the camera moves in a way that the woman is blocked. And when you see the woman again, it's a different woman. It's very funny. It's it's, I don't know how they did that. It's great. But that's going to be great for the DVD. And you know what's something to be said for this film as well? It's a good L.A. love story. We haven't seen a lot of movies set in Los Angeles recently. We all know this is the home of where movies are made, but it's often... Set in Chicago, a Vince Vaughn movie like The Breakup or something, you know, or or set in Boston or shot, obviously, in Canada, but made to look like this is Los Angeles. They're at the AMC Century City Mall. He's throwing his shoes over the railing. Yeah. Like, it's nice to see a good Los Angeles movie, American Cruise, you know, people people here who have been out of work for a while are now getting a chance to work and live at home, which I I really respect. You know, in terms of movies that are that were shot in and around L.A., I think because this movie was sort of a bromance. You know, between Gosling sure. and Carell. I mean, the, the last time I saw a really effective romantic comedy like this was I Love You, Man. Yeah. Again, a romantic comedy told from the guy's point of view. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Knocked up another romantic comedy set here in Los Angeles. But this is free of the Apatow crew. Uh, yes. Not to say that that's a reason why it's good, but just it's independently of that, that whole style of humor. It's not raunchy. Steve Carell's really never made a name for himself by being explicit in his films or doing R-rated comedy. And, and even the 40-year-old virgin, it was a sweet film. Yes. Just at, because it was R-rated. It didn't. They didn't go for the raunchy jokes just for the sake of going for sure. raunchy jokes to push the barrier, although they did. But it, they did it in a way that it was organic, well, not in a way that felt forced. Something we haven't talked about in this film is Emma Stone. Emma Stone. Can we talk about Emma Stone? She is on fire right now. And I got to tell you, even though I saw her in Zombieland and Superbad, I fell in love with Emma Stone, and I'm a married man, and I can say this, but I fell in love with her while watching Easy A last fall. Terrific. That was a terrific performance. It was a breakthrough performance. It paid off in a three-week period. She has Friends with Benefits, small role, this movie, Crazy Stupid Love, and then very soon she has The Help, and she is filming, or just recently finished filming, The Amazing Spider-Man. She plays Gwen Stacy. And more impressive in this town, she keeps her nose clean. I mean, you and I yes. work you and I oh. work at celebrity news outlets that thrive off the misfortunes and missteps of young Hollywood. And this is a girl who's only mentioned on our show when she has movies coming out. Yep. She's somebody who is known for her work. She did a movie like Easy A for I heard a rumored sixty thousand dollars. That's what I heard too. And it changed her career. She hosted SNL. She got a Golden Globe nomination. She has. It. She has and it. and when that happens to you in Hollywood, you get all types of scripts sent your way. Everybody has their moment, and then it's what you do with your moment that proves if you have longevity in this business or not. She's going to be acting into her eighties because of some of the choices she's making now. I think. And I think. And, and this know, film is just. I mean, a, a film that she's not the main star in this film. In fact, there was one point. The first time I saw it was. Boy, did they make this movie before she was a big star and cut her out of the movie? Like I was, oh, I, I, I almost thought like, okay, she's got her one or two scenes in the restaurant with Josh Groban, who's it's very surprising to yeah, see him in was, this, and I hope he does many more things. That's one of those like you know W two TF moments, but, like what? But perfect casting, he's yeah. terrific in he that. He's good in it, yeah. And, and and I thought, wow, did they cut her out in this? But she comes back and she's got a great third act, and she she has great chemistry with Gosling. You believe that Gosling, this guy who could get anyone would want to settle with her and want to be with her. Which... He could get anybody, and he does get everybody. Yeah. But you see through Emma Stone, she she makes her character so vulnerable and so strong that you can see why Gosling would just want to hang up his pickup artist clothes and just stay with her. But the thing, the other thing about Emma Stone is super bad, easy A, uh, Zombieland. She played a teen. She played a high schooler. This is a mature role for her. She yeah. is not in high school. In fact, she's fresh out of college. Yeah. And you know, going back to what you we were saying before about about the, you know these actresses who get these chances and blow it. Obviously, the one I'm talking about specifically is Lindsay Lohan, who, when Easy A came out, they were comparing. Oh, that was her Mean Girls. I mean, in a lot of ways, the redhead comparison is natural. But I mean, a film like that set in high school that's witty and sharp and different, that was her moment. Right. And she's turned it into a a great career and is now getting her her payday, if you will, in Spider-Man. And I know you're super geeked for it. I was next to you at Comic-Con and you were like exploding out of your head. You had the Spider-Man T-shirt on and the whole thing. How do you feel about her as Gwen Stacy? I think she's going to be great. And it's interesting because when she was first cast, because I've only seen her as a redhead, even though she's a natural blonde. I immediately thought that she was going to play Mary Jane. Sure. So when I found out that she was playing playing Gwen Stacy, I went, 
Oh, well, I guess okay. in, in the original comics was uh, was Peter Parker's first love interest, or had a That's strong correct. story yes. arc in the original books. The audiences now from the movies only really think of it as Bryce Dallas Howard as an afterthought in the third right. film. But exactly, the, uh, I guess a big part of the in original the comics. Yeah. His first true love was Gwen Stacy, and then it was Mary Jane. And then getting back to Crazy Stupid Love, you throw in Marissa Tomei, an Oscar winner, with Kevin Bacon, who can go from playing uh, a super villain in, in X Men to showing up in this and being the other man who Julianne Moore has an affair with. I gotta tell you, you He's know, terrific. Really isn't he? I love where Kevin Bacon's at in his career. I would really, you know, when we're done with this, I'm going to go to IMDb and look up Kevin Bacon's credits. And I got to tell you, the guy is in his, what, late 40s, early 50s? Mm-hmm. He probably has more working credits than any other actor ever. Brenna, That's and, why they made a game after yeah, him. Of course. Now he's connected <laughs> to Emma Stone and everybody and Josh Groban. But yes. now, um, you know, <laughs> you, you know I, I interviewed Kevin recently in New York, and he talked about early in his career when he had a lot of success, he thought, maybe I should have, in hindsight, gone after more leading man roles or been more of a celebrity, but it's just not in my DNA. And now I think that's coming back to help him in some ways at this stage in his career because he can show up in a film like this, make it better for the scenes he's in. The date that he goes on with Julianne Moore, it's the perfect tone where it's not incredibly awkward, but it's just not right. You can tell that right. it's not yeah. the same as it should be with Steve Carell. And it helps you root for Steve Carell to get back with her, which I, I appreciated Kevin Bacon's almost humility in taking a role like this. When you have a movie like this, an ensemble film, where every last character, right down to Marissa Tomei and Kevin Bacon, who are they're, they're very supporting characters, but that they could be fully realized with personalities and depth and you get who they are with the few scenes that they're in, that is the definition of good writing, and that is why Crazy Stupid Love holds up and why it's so good. And with all the twists and turns, with the way the son likes the babysitter, but the babysitter has a crush on Steve Carell. The Steve Carell is trying to get his wife back, even though he's having an affair with uh, Marissa Tomei. And there's so many good surprises that don't feel contrived. They don't feel like you saw them coming. And they're or, not sticky, and it doesn't feel like an Owen Wilson movie or a How Do You Know where he's the if he's the ladies' man because he has toothbrushes in his bathroom for all the women. Like that's just silly and not believable. This feels genuine. It's well paced, and and when you when you you know you talk about a movie that's a romantic comedy, is it romantic? Is it funny? And yes, to both of those. Things. Well, and it doesn't matter whether it's it's between Steve Carell and Marissa Tomei or Steve Carell and Ryan Gosling because that relationship they had amazing chemistry like that was a great definition of a of a bromance absolutely you know and and gosling i gotta say again i did not see that coming with him he was so damn funny in but i mean movie. what what's he been bad in if you really look at the he's I never mean, been bad you look at the, the the resume of films you're talking about kevin bacon's imdb for every you know kevin bacon's a great actor but he's got a few stinkers to, to his credit a lot of working actors do but gosling has really been smart about the material he's chosen to do. I'm he's sure he gets offered prepared. every studio film you could imagine. Even the movie he made with Anthony Hopkins, the lawyer movie, was still okay. Oh, that, that was, was good. In, you know, I forget the name of it, but Fracture, I think. It Fracture, was. Yeah. that was good. But I mean, he's from Half Nelson and 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 Blue Valentine. The stuff he's done with producer Jamie Patrickoff over the years. Gosling just is a. A beast of an actor and has been smart again in choosing those films that are of quality, even outside of simply just great roles for him to take. And I on. think, too, I think this is going to, this is really going to be, and I, it's weird to say this as a breakthrough year for him because he has been acting for so many years. But after, after Crazy Stupid Love, this fall, he's got two very big, very different roles. One of them is a movie called Drive. Which I did With see. Carrie Mulligan. Carrie Mulligan. Yeah. This movie is fantastic. He plays a stunt driver for movies who also moonlights as a getaway driver for robberies. Terrific premise. And it's a great premise. And he falls in love with his neighbor, Carrie Mulligan, whose husband is in the slammer. When this when he gets out of the slammer, Ryan Gosling tries to help him out and he gets himself into some very hot water. And the movie starts off as this unusual romance. No pun intended. It takes a detour mm. into a you you don't know where the movie's going. It's stylish, it's arty, it's cool, and it's violent. And it, it Albert Brooks Albert Brooks plays a villain and that you just talk about another revelation. But even after Drive, Ryan Gosling has 
the Ides of March. That's going to be the big Oscar contender for him. He was so close last year with Blue Valentine, yeah. and I felt yeah. un- undeservedly was overlooked. I mean, that's a performance that's so linked with Michelle Williams. How can you honor one without the other? But it seems the Ides of March with George Clooney, it's, we were talking about, it's going to be up at Toronto this year. That's going to be the one that gets him sort of over the Oscar hump, I think. I mean, this- he was nominated for Half Nelson a few years ago, but... I think he'll be back again for this one. You know, and for and for The Ides of March, this is a movie that George Clooney directed as well as co-wrote with his writing partner from Good Night and Good Luck, Grant Heslov. And this is a movie that's based on the play Farrick at North. And, Which Chris, uh, your buddy Chris Pine, Captain yeah, Kirk, did here Captain in Hollywood with Chris Nolte. That's yep. right. And he was great in it. Yeah. And I really thought he was going to get that role. I thought he should have. But it's in good hands anyway with Ryan Gosling. And uh, this is a movie that... You know, people have always sort of thought of Clooney as someone who might go into politics, but he said, no, he's got too much, like, uh, too many skeletons in his, in his right, closet. He couldn't right. do it. But regardless, seeing him in the trailer play a politician, he looks, this movie looks terrific. Looks the part, yeah. And Gosling is primed for award season. But I think he'll also get some awards attention for this, not from the Screen Actors Guild or from, uh, the, from the Oscars, but from those wacky journalists at the Hollywood Foreign Press. Very true. Best actor in a role, music or com- musical or comedy. I feel like with with the way that the Golden Globes uh, honors comedic performances and comedic films, I think you'll see. Ryan, that be I think you'll see Ryan Gosling. I think you'll see Steve Carell, and I think you'll see the movie all get nominations at the Golden Globes. Definitely. This year. Definitely. And let's talk about why. Because this summer, okay, this summer, I, as much as I love the summer movies, and as much as the summer movies are all about making money and popcorn films and all that fun stuff, this year was a bit overkill. You had four superhero movies alone so many sequels so many prequels well, the sequels were very disappointing to me i'm like yeah. you scott where i, I love a, a big story on a great canvas and uh, i love a big friday night popcorn movie but with the hangover 2 being offensive and derivative yep. and boring if they remade the first movie but not but but, the, but, but it wasn't much funny poorly, uh, much more poorly done and just terrible uh, just terrible plot turns in that and some ancillary characters that were borderline racist just an everybody get rich kind of movie and yep. forget about the audience. Totally agree. And now and then you had the Cars Two and and Kung Fu Panda Two, which were both disappointing for yeah, the kids. Yeah, especially Cars Two. That came from Pixar. Didn't deliver at the box office the way either studio expected it to, and was just not a, a, a anywhere close to the originals. I agree. Transformers Three, which you and I had to endure crap. in Russia, which crap. is just pure crap. And we flew seven thousand miles for that. Crap. I, I I enjoyed the borscht. I was sitting next to you because I could see that you were sitting next to me having the same reaction that I did. It's it's unfortunate when you have these big summer movies that you know are going to be shown across the world and are are really kind of just these uh, American exports, if you will, and they're just irresponsible and lazy and racist and sexist and homophobic and just just horrible from start to finish. Speaking of horrible, I think we sort of felt the same way about horrible bosses. Fun but forgettable, amusing at times. You didn't like it. I didn't as like much it as, as much I as, as you. I, I I appreciated Colin Farrell and doing something different that we haven't seen him do a kind. And he's having a nice resurgence in yeah. his career with he's Fright got Fright Night, Night coming out, which soon. is a lot of fun. And he plays the next uh, the vampire and that next door to Anton Derek Yelkin. Dandridge. Very funny. And then he's got, you know, he's got this film. And he even had earlier in the year, The Way Back, the Peter Weir movie. He played a Russian Nobody gangster. Nobody saw it. Nobody saw it, I think, but me and people related good. to Colin Farrell. Yeah. yeah, and you saw it. I uh, saw it, of course. You know, so an interesting time for him. But, but yeah, Horrible Bosses, okay, fine, fine studio film. Nothing too memorable from See, the problem the I, th- I have with the movie like Horrible Bosses is that's a rated R film. And I think it tried really hard to earn its R rating and maybe even push the boundaries for it sure. because it did try too hard. Yes, yeah, some of the jokes worked, some didn't. But you compare that to a movie like Friends with Benefits where, where yeah, there was nudity and, yeah, they dropped the F-bomb a few times, but it didn't feel forced. It was it was all natural. But that organic. director, Will Gluck's turning into a fine filmmaker who did he EZA is. and now he's done this. It'll be fun to see what he does next if he stays in the romantic comedy genre or pulls a Mark Webb who did 500 Days of Summer and switches gears completely to do Spider-Man. Boy, that's a big switch. I would like to see Will Gluck maybe take on a big, big high-budget kind of concept film like that. But getting back to the summer recap, I mean, we said Transformers, we talked about, was terrible. Terrible. The sequels to The Hangover and Cars 2 and... Some of the new superheroes we were introduced to, like Green Lantern, Green Lantern bad. just missed the mark oh, completely. That was terrible. That's terrible. one of those movies, you, the first five minutes, you say to yourself, how do, how am I going to survive for yeah. 90 minutes? That was an overwritten, overproduced movie. The CGI looked phony. Now, Thor and, and Captain America, I thought, were fine. But the the big surprise to me, because, because the studio kind of had it hidden, 
was X Men First Class going back to Kevin Bacon. Yeah, not you know it's great now when when movies and characters are the stars, not stars. People yeah. didn't go to see that movie because they love James McAvoy or Jennifer Lawrence. Those are all talented actors, Michael yeah. Fassbender, but they're not box office names yet. Uh, I, uh, Jennifer Lawrence will be after she plays Katniss in the Hunger Games, Hunger Games. coming out in March. I'm a yeah. huge fan of those books and very excited for that. Uh, but 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 again, people went to see that because it was a good movie and it was right. well done. And Matthew Vaughn, who did Kick Ass, had a following from that film that he brought to this. And and he took he took the series back to its to its rightful place because the first two X Men films were great, but the third movie was not so good. The Wolverine spinoff was was totally cliche written and derivative. Mm -hmm. And this film, because the studio didn't screen it till not even a week before it opened here in L.A. And when it was over, I was like, my God, that was fantastic. You know, origin stories um, can be tricky nowadays with superheroes. Sure, but because they follow a formula. And, and I feel like superhero movies have become too much of a good thing because, you know, because I'm a little older than you, I could say that when I saw the first Superman, it was special. When I saw the first Batman, it was special. But when you're at an age, at a time when you've got so many superhero movies One a month out, now. Yeah. In a 10-week period, you had four superhero movies. I get that, but Batman and Iron Man and Spider-Man, these studios are salivating to find the next big franchise. But when they do it in a way where it's cliche, derivative, when the stakes are the world domination, it has to be grounded in reality. Yeah. I think that's the formula now. You look at a film like X-Men, which is about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. You look at a film, a franchise like Iron Man, which takes place in present day and feels real. Captain America was a big hit, although at times cheesy with some of the dialogue and the romance, sure. but uh, a movie set during World War II and grounded in yeah, real Yeah, it events. felt like an Indiana Jones movie. Absolutely. Yeah, and totally. so when you, when you can take these over-the-top characters and villains and these, these absurd premises, to put it in something that feels real, I think connects with audiences nowadays. Another winner, I have to say, because we are talking about X-Men, Rose Byrne. Great Rose summer Byrne for her with, with Bridesmaids. And, and Insidious. Yeah, it's terrifying. If movie. you have not seen Insidious, man... That is a scary friggin' movie. It is the movie I have to sort of compare it to is Poltergeist. It is not a yeah. gory sort of Saw hostile kind of. No, R I'm not into those torture porn films at all. I don't want to spend ten dollars to watch somebody get their toenails ripped off. But I've never movie, been a fan of those movies. I never will. I appreciate that some people are into that kind of stuff, but I think it's far more challenging and far more effective to but do it's a film genuinely thrilling that's just scary and you're on the edge of your seat because you don't know what's next. And that's a, a finer level of filmmaking for me than than anybody getting their guts poured out. And and I, and I agree. And and her role in in Bridesmaids, which was another which was a great surprise i loved bridesmaids and i i compared it to you know of course everybody did they said it was the female version of the hangover and when i saw bridesmaids because i think it came out like a week or two before hangover part two i said wow these guys uh better well, watch their backs. But watch now you're gonna start seeing all these studio films coming about a group of girls who go for a bachelor weekend yeah. or you're gonna start to see i heard reese witherspoon signed on to one where she goes to vegas with a group of girls it's gonna you're gonna start to see that kind of domino effect. With yeah, the every studio goes. Every studio goes. Where's our bridesmaids? I want to talk to you uh, as we wrap up the summer here. We, we we talked about how much we love Crazy Stupid Love, which is opening this weekend. I think we agree the best movie of the weekend. Absolutely, by no, far. No question. Um, but let's talk about this theme of alien invasions this summer. Sure. We, we, Green Lantern is an alien story. It was terrible. But there's three that we should discuss. Super Eight. Right. Which I, I don't know your take on that. I, I liked it. I didn't love it. Uh, Super 8, you know, the, here's the movie J.J. Abrams directed as a Valentine to Steven Spielberg's classics. Close like Encounters and E.T. E and all the great the movies. Goonies, yeah. Gremlins even, and of course, you know, J.J. Abrams' own Cloverfield. But, you know, the problem I had with, with, with Super 8, while it was a, it was a touching coming-of-age coming story, that part worked really well for me. The kids cast in this movie were great. And that's when it felt very Spielbergian. Again, going to see a movie because of the movie and the characters on screen, not so much because it's Bradley Cooper is the cop or something. Right. It's not, no box office draws in, in this film in the cast. And that's All why, unknowns pretty much, which was fun. That's what I liked about the yeah. film. What I didn't like about it is I felt that, that J.J. tried a little too hard to hit all these notes that the movie, it didn't. It, there was a disjointed flow to it. It, you know, when I when I was watching Super Eight, 
I was thinking about E.T. and Close Encounters and thinking about how great those movies are, but how just good this movie is. The only thing I had, uh, the only problem I had was Super 8 because I really enjoyed it. I loved it. I, I was late. I was on vacation for the screenings leading up to it. So I saw it opening night oh, in fun. Union Square, sat in the balcony, packed house. And I appreciated seeing something new when you go to the theater and it's every trailer is it all ends and it's Harry Potter's ending or Transformers ending. And then it, it all begins. Captain Thor, Captain yeah, America, Captain America Thor, Captain Thor. You know what I mean? So it's just everything's <laughs> beginning, everything's ending. It's nice to see something new and fresh. But like you said, those films, Close Encounters, E.T., Gremlins, they weren't aware of themselves. Right, this was they were what they were. Aware. Yeah, and this and the, the only uh, knock I really have against it is that it was trying too hard to be that instead of just being that. Uh, that's I my love problem. the film. I really enjoyed it, and the kids are great. And um, the the monster reveal in the third act hits. Yes, but it's you can tell it's very self aware and very yes. self conscious. It's, at it's times, almost sort which sort almost of, distracts you, I think, at, at, throughout the film. And it did distract me. That's why I, I, as much as I wanted to love it, I only liked it. Now, I, I th that, that sounds like a slam, and I like like other people I've talked to, and even my my written review for it. Like I read over it, and I feel like you know I would have to show it to people. It's like, does this sound like I'm slamming the movie? Because I did like it. I've recommended it. I just you know when you hold your standards, when you when you're trying to do a classic, and it's not a classic, it's it's obvious. Yeah, and then it's it's almost unfair to the film to then like you said, do you say it's a bad movie? No, it's a very good movie. And Spielberg just, produced this movie. Spielberg too. produced the film. JJ, his writing, his signature pacing is is evident and palpable throughout. The kids are great. It's just not a as a classic as a movie as you would maybe want it, which is an unfair expectation, I think, of a film. And I went into the Cowboys and Aliens with similar expectations. Speaking of Spielberg, who also I produced. wanted it to be the best movie of the summer and to love it and to be great. And it's much better as a Western, I think, than it is as a sci-fi film. It's, it's more Cowboys you know, this, than Aliens. It opens this weekend. Daniel Craig plays a cowboy who mysteriously comes into a, a town and you don't know his backstory, which is the, the formula for great Westerns like Shane and High Noon over the years. Sure. And Searchers. Searchers. And and an alien spacecraft lands in the town, and there and lands and blows the crap blood, out yeah. of it. <laughs> and, and, and people go missing, and Craig, along with Harrison Ford, who, who's back on the horse for the first time since the Frisco Kid in the late seventies, are uh, in, in a western even. Um, have to go on this quest to find the people from their town, right? Because they were all abducted, right? They're all abducted, and it's got moments of that Spielberg movie magic, but too few and far between. And I think it kind of loses its focus once it turns into a big action movie in the third act. The problem I had with uh, with Cowboys and Aliens is you have five credited screenwriters, five producers, six executive producers, four co-producers, and this is the best they could come up with. Let's talk about some of those producers. Brian Steven Grazer, Spielberg, Steven Spielberg, Brian Grazer, Ryan Ron, Ron Howard. Ron Howard. It's directed by John Favreau, who did Iron Man, and then of course you've got Indiana Jones and James Bond in the same movie. And I just felt that the story was dull, the characters were weak, the dialogue was trite. It was, it was. I called it how the West was lost in space. Well said, Scott Mance. And well, thank you, Ben Lyons. Sam and Rockwell I, improves everything he's in, and he makes this better when he's on screen. I especially Sam when he Rockwell has his little payoff. This. I like he, Sam Rockwell. He a lot. has his little payoff. He he provides some moments of levity into the to the film, and he's terrific as but always. The, but, but you're the right; aliens. the characters are weak. Adam Beach is a far more talented actor than the material. I feel like exactly. they gave him. He's known for Flags of Our Fathers and a few other Great things. But um, but yeah, the aliens. They were so much like the aliens that you saw in Independence Day, War of the Worlds, Battle of Los Angeles. There's but there, there was no consistency to how they are defeated. Right. Does a, a, a bullet from a six shooter maim them or does it, does it simply yeah. – do they ignore that kind of impact? It just I, didn't I couldn't work. figure out exactly how they would die and that's a pretty basic thing. And I, I remember you saw the movie, movie before I did. I did. I saw it in And Montana. I emailed you. Yeah. And and you remember what you wrote back to me? No, I was probably drunk on moonshine. Uh, if you Hoover. said underwhelming, that's all you had to say because yeah. I saw it at the premiere of Comic Con. And boy, talk about a buildup! Having a big Hollywood presence, a big, huge thing with the bleachers and the fans. It was oh, like I was live show. for two hours. Yeah. Yes, you were there. I was for... on the jumbotron. Oh, in, yeah. in the theater. I know what a big deal it was. And again, a good movie. 
not a great movie. No, not what I, you I can't even go be. there for good, pal. I enjoyed I it because, again, for, it's for something good. fresh in a summer season of stale things. Now, you and I have a deal right now. We're going to each recommend a movie to each other that we ha- that the other person has not seen. Okay. And then we're going to come back here the next time we're here. We're going to catch up on it, and we'll talk about it. All Sounds right? good. So Attack the Block in the theme of alien movies is out this weekend. It's from director Joe Cornish, who grew up with Edgar Wright and all those guys across the pond. A bunch of 15-year-olds in, in, in a British housing project are committing petty crimes. The movie opens with the, the, the leader, Moses, of the gang. He robs a, a young woman, a young nurse in the neighborhood. And they're punk little kids who are full of energy and directed in all the wrong places. And then an alien invasion comes to <laughs> comes to the Another housing project. Another alien invasion movie. <laughs> but it's got this B-movie, uh, student film kind of quality to it. Made for only 7 or 8 million pounds in the U.K., First time director and a bunch all the unknown kids. Nick Frost from those great movies with Simon Pegg. Cool. He's in the film. Uh, Hot very, Fuzz, Shaun of the Dead. Uh, and it's just cool. And the kids have a, a, a bravado and a swagger that is unique to South London. They use great slang and they, it's just different than what you would see from American kids. There's a young kid in who's going to be the next Shia LaBeouf. I sat with the lead, Joey Boyega, the other day, who's going to uh, has a, a, a leading man future as an action hero at this, in this at times. A lot of fun. you got to promise me you go see Attack the Block. I will see this if you see Another Earth. I've heard only amazing things. And you're going to hear more amazing things right now. This is a movie that's screened at Sundance. It won the Audience Award, and for good reason. It's a, it's actually a quintessential Sundance movie because even though it has a sci-fi premise, it was shot for less than $500,000, and it has wow. a compelling story. What is it about? Less than $500,000. This studio is like 10 times as much as that. Look, this is amazing. This, here, this is an amazing studio. This is exactly. way more than the budget of the this movie. This is more than the budget it. for Another Earth. <laughs> but what the film is about, it's it was it's starring and co-written by Britt Marling. Keep an eye on her. She's, she's definitely going to make a name for herself, and she's really cute. She plays uh, a recent college grad or a high school grad who's about to go away to college, and she gets drunk uh, at a party. She gets behind the wheel of a car. She's listening to the radio in her car, and the radio announcer says, oh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the weirdest thing. They just discovered another planet going around the sun. It's actually in the same orbit as the Earth. And if you look out the window, you can see it right now. So she's been drinking. She looks out the window. She looks up, and she, she hits the car in front of her, kills the driver's wife and kid. And the driver is William Maypother, who is Tom Cruise's cousin, but he was also in in the bedroom and he was on Lost. Sure. And uh, so four years later, she gets out of jail for involuntary manslaughter and she goes to redeem herself and she gets very involved with William Maypother's character who has no idea that she killed his wife and kid. And at all that, this is set against the backdrop, the planet that they discovered is an exact replica of the Earth that is now hanging in the night sky just as as plain and as in view as the as the moon and it's not just a duplicate of the earth everybody on our earth has an exact duplicate on this other earth try it it sounds very convoluted but it's very compelling try and imagine what would happen if stanley kubrick were still alive and he made a low budget film this would be it. See it. All right. So those are the movies we have to see next time. Uh, we want to take some calls if anybody's out there still indulging us and checking us out. Is anybody on Twitter? Maria, are you asleep in there? Is anybody on Twitter with some questions? They like Mance's Sundance t-shirt? I um, I haven't checked Twitter, to be honest. I was paying attention to your lovely commentary on summer movies. Um, and then we were trying to adjust... Since this went crazy, stupid love slash summer movie review. Yeah, reviews. we got a Mance and I. We, we, <laughs> we went off on a tangent. So often. <laughs> there was a little bit of a tangent, but we appreciate it and love the passion. So <laughs> we're in here adjusting graphics so that everyone's on the same page. Okay, all we right. were all over the place, weren't we? We were. We were a little sidetracked, but because it has been, it's that there's a lot to talk a about. Lot to talk about. We just got back from Comic Con. We got Toronto on the horizon. We both agree that that crazy, stupid love is the movie to see this weekend. But well, one movie that we did see that we both loved. Was Planet of the Apes? Oh, yeah, <laughs> we did. <laughs> <laughs> this movie, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, is f- it opens next Friday. Directed by Rupert Wyatt, 
And, and Starring James Franco. Is it a reboot? Is it a remake? Is it a, a prequel? It's a, it's a prequel in every sense of the word. It takes yeah. all the other Planet of the Apes incarnations from Charlton Heston to Mark Wahlberg and all that, throws them out the window, yep. and this is the beginning story. This is how we got to this the point. how we got how, to yeah. the point. But it's, it's you know, because the Mark Wahlberg version, which came out 10 years ago, which I can't believe it's, it's been so that laughable. Long. Tim Ross, Paul bad. Giamatti, Estella Warren. I don't know what she's doing. It was nowadays. bad. And you know what? That it came from the mind of Tim Burton. Tim Burton's far better at adapting his own original material than he is at adapting the works of others. And I think that's a great example of a movie where it didn't work. But that version was soul crushing because I love the original films. I mean, I grew up with them. But what the, what's great about this version is where the older films, the, the, the apes were human beings wearing makeup. This is all CGI. It's all from the Weta team, huh? Down and, in New Zealand. I think they and all it did works. It just works. Then and this is Andy Circus. Andy plays Circus Hermione. plays Caesar, who is a real character. He's this little ape that James Franco rescues from a research lab and then raises as raises if his him. own son. And he and he he's he has a a, a truth serum like a serum in, injected into that increases his intelligence exponentially it's to the point it's terrific frida pinto from slumdog millionaire is his girlfriend tom felton uh from the the harry potter series uh is the the the, the um the guy who kind of looks after the apes at the research facility and he's kind of got a mean side to him little little malfoy sneaking out into felton still but the movie itself but just moved and well from the trailers and from the conversations in hollywood everybody thought this is going to be laughable and a joke and silly and I don't know if people can take James Franco too seriously nowadays anymore, yeah. which is unfortunate because he is such a good actor. He's almost become a cartoon of himself. Well, he was great in, in 127 way. Hours, oh, but then he hosted the Oscars, and that's where and, people... and had Your Highness at the same time. It was yeah. just in the soap opera, and it's just too much for some people. But immensely talented, delivers a, a great leading performance in this, in a film that is pretty trippy and pretty scary at times. It's very suspenseful, very gripping, intense, but it's also very fun and very entertaining. Yeah, so it zips by really fast, it's but an hour and 40 minutes, hour moves, 45. It's not it's not just There's not overbearing a with minute. action and love stories that don't that you don't care about. It's just yeah, just a fun th th don't give me a love movie. story. So Come that on. comes out, that comes out next week. We'll talk about that and a few other things as we round up the summer and, and, and head towards Toronto. I'll see you up there in Canada. I'll see you up there too. Fantastic. Well, Maria and everybody here, thank you for having us. It's a lot of fun. I hope hey, we're welcome before back. Before you go, I have a quick, few quick questions. Oh, that we awesome. Fire away. Let's hear it, Maria. All right, Phil, why don't you jump in here? Hey, guys. So we've, we've been promoting this on, um, you know, on our website and things like that. And so the big question is, you know, in terms of the symbolism, obviously they keep going to the photo of, of – um, Julianne Moore and Steve Carell, and in the beginning, when um, the babysitter drops it, it's broken and things like that. What, what was your take on that and sort of also the shoe motif? That is a question. It seems like the directors had a little bit of a, a foot fetish as the movie opened and throughout. There That's are a lot a of, but, but you can learn a lot about people from the kind of shoes that they wear, I guess. Ryan Gosling has the slick loafers, Steve Carell has, has the, the schleppy new balance, like, new balance sneakers, sneakers yeah, you know. Yeah, right. Um, I, the, the, as far as the posters go and the, and the marketing of this, I think they're missing the mark. I think they're just taking screen grabs from the movie as, a, as opposed to coming with original artwork. Oh, uh, well, well I, I get the – I think it's actually kind of clever to the point where they take each word in the film title and take a screen grab from the movie to match the word. And the stupid one where Ryan Gosling is being held back by Steve Carell and, and Kevin Bacon – uh, that's the one that's sort of like, you know, you're driving by and the, the, the billboard and you're like, what? Yeah. And I'm telling you, man, uh, one other person in this film who really gives a great breakthrough performance and uh, I think really holds her own with people like Steve Carell and Ryan Gosling and Julian Moore. And darn it, if I forgot her name, she plays the babysitter. Terrific in this. She She's so good in this. Is so good in this movie, and I, I'm, I'm embarrassed and ashamed. Tough to cast kids, but I think, <laughs> you know, when we've been talking about the summer and, and a lot of these movies that missed the mark, uh, great summer for, for child actors and young actors that we're just discovering now. First oh. and second kind of films and projects, I think. So well, you know what movie we didn't talk about? Was what? Mid we've been here for an hour. We've talked Midnight about Midnight in Paris. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Midnight in Paris. That is now Woody Allen's. Highest grossing film ever beating Hannah and her sisters. That Amazing. came out in 86. I know, and it's great to see Owen Wilson and, and Rachel McAdams together. They seem to be having a lot of fun with this. And Woody it's just, Allen! It's so refreshing when you have, you know, it's smart for studios to release a movie like Midnight in Paris amongst 
uh, Green Lantern and Transformers and all the, the crap that's out there. And yeah. It really kind of stands out. But let's get back to Crazy Super Love. A few more questions before we call it a day. We got one more. Phil? Let's hear it. Hey, guys. Um, are <laughs> you at all familiar with J.R. Moringer's The Tender Bar? Um, a fan asks. The Tender Bar? Tender Bar. I don't know. It's Friday night, and I'm trying to get to a bar. The tender Bar. It is happy hour. It's getting there. <laughs> uh, no. Enlighten us, please. All right. So... Well, let me let me just check it right now. Okay, so the Tender Bar, according to Amazon, it's it's a memoir by a writer, J.R. Moringer, and it's basically his coming of age story at a bar. And so, obviously, um, the, as the fan writes, I'm kind of p- paraphrasing. It's they spend a lot of time at the bar in this movie. And do you feel like, in many ways, it's Steve Carell and Ryan Gosling's coming of age story? Um, and this is like their place, the bar. I like the comparison, and the bar is a central figure in this character, Very much. in this in this story, this character-driven story. It becomes a character to itself. I do want to find out where this bar is in Los Angeles. I was going to ask you if you know where that bar the was. The most beautiful women in the world. It's like, wait a minute, I've been living in LA for twenty years. All the time. I've never been there. But it's like it's a it's a lounge kind of bar. It's not a big nightclub, but it's not a dive bar. And it's not crowded. It's not crowded. You can always get a good table. It looks like a, just an, an amazing. Ben, amazing ben, place. ben, this is a movie. It's a movie. It's not, you, you know. We listen, talked about how it's grounded in reality. And I've been off the movie. market for a couple of years now, but I have to say, when I was a single guy and I was single for a very long time, and look, I am not a slouch, but it was never Man. that easy for me, <laughs> dude. I've dated a lot of girls in Hollywood, but darn, I just had a hard time going up to women at bars, being like. Hey, how you doing? Hey, Scott it just doesn't work, I man. I know Maria Menounos. I mean, go I'd be, get out of here. I wouldn't be wearing the freaking Sundance T-shirt. I'd be <laughs> styling. I'd wear a shirt and tie, or not a, not a tie, but a jacket. And just, man, they just shoot you down. They just shoot you down. They rip your heart out. They show it to you while it's still beating. This is Hollywood. That is a movie. <laughs> I, I do not miss my single life at all. I lucked out. I have an amazing wife, and she's she's the greatest. But I, I for, for a split second, I thought, man, where is that bar? Who are these girls who go to that bar? And I went... Dude, it's a movie. It's a movie. It's, it's yes. not that easy. It's a movie. It's I know. not that easy. I'm telling you. But it, it is to answer not that the easy. fans' question, yes, this is a coming the of age story. <laughs> the, the guns are not the real. The guns are not. The man's guns are real. The gun. <laughs> man's is on that Gyllenhaal beach workout right now. Um, yeah, no. The, uh, the this is a coming of age story for the two of them. Gosling realizes that his. Uh, you know his 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 ways as a womanizer are, are quickly coming to an end because they're not making him happy. There's a, a scene with Emma Stone where he says, "I buy all this crap in my house because I'm not happy." Right. And he realizes he needs to change his life and settle down. And Steve Carell realizes he needs to change his life, and there's a reason why he lost his wife and he needs to get her back. So and definitely I, and a coming I, of age story. And I love coming of age stories for people in their 30s and 40s. And well, it doesn't have to be movie, just for 15 year olds. Ben, any movie where you have the growth and evolution of a character. Is is significant and very important because it, and this is this film is a great example because not only you know when the story starts off, Steve Carell's in the dumps. Ryan Gosling helps him be a better man, but in the process, Steve Carell helps Ryan Gosling also be a better man because at first Gosling is giving Carell advice, and then at the end. Carell is getting Gosling advice. Well, there is no better man I know in Hollywood than Scott Mance. Your enthusiasm for film is infectious. I'm honored to sit across the table ben, from you here at After Buzz TV. Been a long time coming. It's been a long time coming. Hopefully, this it will be a long time until we do it again. And a privilege, Ben Lyons, the first of many times. This is just the beginning, pal. Well, you guys at home can always tweet us right here at After Buzz TV. At AfterBuzz uh, TV. At AfterBuzz TV. You can tweet me at I am Ben Lyons. Uh, if you can put up with all the Knicks and hip hop talk, we'll talk some movies. And we can, <laughs> you can tweet me at I am Ben Lyons too until I get my act together <laughs> okay. on Twitter. Now you're at Movie Mance. <laughs> I'm at Movie Mance. It's M A N T Z. Movie Mance. You can catch Scott on Axis Hollywood and in the taxi cabs in New York City. And you can catch Ben Lyons on E and everywhere else. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Enjoy Crazy Stupid Love this weekend. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon from the AfterBuzz headquarters. Peace. Peace out. From producers Kevin Undergaro and Phil Svitek, engineer DJ Jesse Janity, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. If you have questions or comments, be sure to buzz us at info at AfterBuzzTV.com. And you can find us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter by searching for AfterBuzzTV. Buzz you later. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzzTV or its owners or principals.